going to talk today about something uh, called the, the Future Financial Advisor. Right? I, I wrote a blog post and I've been thinking a lot about what a role like ours would look like in the future based on technology that we have today, based on the way markets look, the international flavor, the appetites for those investing, the ages, the, the technology ability of those that are looking to invest and grow and, and what the trends are. So I've been thinking a lot about what the future financial advisor looks like. Of course, none of this is to be taken as financial advice, none of this is to be taken as some sort of gospel. Uh, it's not based on a tremendous amount of research, it's based on a tremendous amount of talking to clients, other financial advisors, platforms that are out there. Uh, and trying to determine what a role like ours will look like in the future. To do that, we need to step back a little bit. Back in, uh, say, the, the early years of the century, the, in the, the 20s, 30s, we'll, we'll, we won't go all the way back to the 20s, but we'll say the late 30s, 40s, 50s, yeah, even in the 60s, the, quote, financial advisor was actually the, what, what people call the stockbroker. I, and the stockbroker's job was to help evaluate and pick stocks, right? And they got paid a commission based on how much stock you bought. You actually bought individual stocks. Now, there wasn't a whole lot of thought put towards financial planning, per se, because the financial planning was easy. People worked for the same company for their entire life, and when they retired at age 60 or 65, they got their social security and they got a pension. And a pension just means you get a certain amount of, of money every month or every year for the rest of your life. It's guaranteed, uh, it's paid for by the company you work for. There weren't a whole lot of decisions. People bought a house, they stayed in that house forever. They bought cars as they needed them, but they kept their cars a long time. Um, and, and people, to be honest, didn't live all that long. So if you retired at 60 or 65, you probably didn't live much past 75 or 80. There wasn't a whole lot to plan for. You went and you did your work, you saved money in the bank, and whatever money you had left over, you might call a stockbroker who would help you evaluate and pick stocks, and that stockbroker would make a commission. You also, most of those people had insurance. Insurance was just there for protection, right? But they would go to their insurance agent and they might buy life insurance to protect them if something happened to them. Uh, at some point later, maybe 50s, 60s, they would have disability insurance. Okay? And this person also got paid a commission. The insurance agent got a commission, the stockbroker got a commission. The other important person that someone might have in their life is their bank, right? And the banker was very important because if I needed to borrow money, right, I would go to my friend or, or my contact who is the banker, and we would negotiate the terms of some sort of loan. It might be to buy a house or a car or send my kids to college, maybe to start a business or something. Um, and this banker usually got paid some sort of fees uh, or commission based on the, the loans that they might uh, offer or the, or the loans they might end up giving to their clients. So these were the main financial people in someone's life. There wasn't a whole lot of planning because there weren't a whole lot of moving parts and there weren't as many variables. Today we see so many more variables. So along the way, what happened, before I go off, along the way what happened is stockbrokers stopped just having big stocks. Um, insurance agents who were licensed to their state insurance board started going, wait, 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 we want to be able to sell stocks too. Right? Why don't we get licensed to do that? Stockbrokers started to go, whoa, wait, 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 we don't like the insurance agents coming into our business. We're just going to go get an insurance license so we can sell insurance to our clients. Also, what happened was the, the um, pretty aggressive growth of mutual funds. And a mutual fund 
is pretty simple because the, the people who are best at picking stocks would just say, look, instead of our going to try to find every individual client to help pick stocks for and earn a commission on each one, we're just going to create this company called a mutual fund. And within this company, we're going to pick our, our stocks, right? Okay, we're going to buy and sell stocks within here, within this, and we don't really care who the clients are. That's up to some other investment advisor to get the clients to put their money in here, and we will take a, a fee or a load or whatever it might be. Sometimes it's up front, sometimes it's when you sell, sometimes it's along the way. And there's also a spread, right? So I, I buy for for one price, I sell for another, and the, the fund company might make the spread. So now the best stockbrokers became mutual fund managers. And now you had some other stockbrokers who were now financial advisors selling these mutual funds. And for selling these mutual funds, they would get a commission. It was based on the amount that was put into the fund. Now, you also had insurance agents getting their securities license and saying they're financial advisors and selling mutual funds, again, for a commission. And if I pay 5% up front to be in this mutual fund, Three of that might go to whoever the advisor is, whether it's an insurance agent or a former stockbroker known as a financial advisor. Around the same time, these products got much more complex because this is a fund, whereas now you also have insurance products, right? So you might have universal life insurance. Then you have annuities. These got much more complex. They added a bunch of fees onto these. And now you had to start having these, these insurance agents who are also investment advisors or financial advisors and the regular financial advisors who also had their insurance license competing for the same clients. These people were trying to say, no, no, go, go into my mutual funds. I want all your money into these mutual funds and you can buy some cheap life insurance. These people were saying, really, hey, I want you to buy my life insurance, my disability insurance, and my annuities, and, and I can also put some money in the mutual funds for you. Okay? And they were all getting commissions. Lost in all this kind of was the banker, because the banker was just going, hey, I, you know, I want to hold on to your, your safe money, put it in the bank, and uh, we can make you a loan. By the way, we also have certificates of deposit, and then banks started offering insurance. Banks started offering investment services. Everything got very muddled up. Everyone is making different fees and commissions. And what's left is the client isn't quite sure what the best advice is, what they should really do for their financial life. All they know is they have all these different tools. And if their friend or their agent happens to be more of an insurance agent who happens to have a securities license, they're probably going to end up with more insurance products and some mutual funds. If their financial advisor happens to be more of an investment person, they're gonna end up with more mutual funds and a little bit of insurance. Uh, if they happen to get their financial advice from someone at the bank, they're gonna end up probably putting some money into CDs and, and into the bank, and maybe get a loan, and they might buy some mutual funds and some insurance. There was no way to really figure out what the best way was. And, and everything got very confusing. On top of that, people started actually changing jobs at some point, where they didn't work for the same company for their whole life. Uh, people started living longer. They started working longer. So this got all messed up. And so you had um, what, what I feel was one of the first breaks 
uh, in, in all that structure. In the mid 80s, when you went from people investing in the uh, in, in their pension at their off at, at their company to 401k, and, and I can go into this more in the lesson. But what happened was with the pension plan, if I work for a certain for for a company, right? If I work for Exxon. I was going to work there for my whole life, and Exxon said, we'll take care of you. When you retire at age 65, we will give you a certain amount of money every month for the rest of your life. And it was Exxon's job to manage this pension fund such that all the employees who turned age 65 and lived were getting X money per month. The problem was the employees said, well, wait a minute. This is really conservative, the way you manage this. When they started getting insight into how this was managed, they said, this is way too conservative for us. We can do better. And, and at the same time, there, there were new ERISA laws. ERISA is the, is the Department of Labor law that governs really 401k. And there were new laws out there. And, and employees said, we want to manage our own retirement funds. We want to control how much goes in. We want to control how it's invested. Um, and employers said, have at it. We don't want to manage these pension funds anymore. This is a pain for us. It's a lot of stress. It's a lot of calculation. You guys complain about it all the time. Here you go. You can manage your own. So now the employees put their money into the 401k. They get to choose where it's allocated. And then when they retire, they get to take their money out. Okay. So what you have, one is you have people all of a sudden that decided we can do this better than these companies and these pensions can. Uh, what we've seen from the 80s till now is individuals actually do a horrible job of managing this. They have much less money and much less prepared for retirement than they used to be. Okay. Individuals are just not very good at this. What that speaks to is their behavior. Um, what we've also found is now there's a need for more financial advice because what you have is people having a choice. Because now, one, they're changing jobs a lot more often. They might be moving from one house to another, so now I have my paycheck. And in the past, all I do was my paycheck, some of, them went, some of it went into the bank, some went into expenses, some went into uh, some sort of growth, some went into some sort of protection, right? So this is insurance, this is safe money sitting in the bank, this is, I gotta pay my bills, right? My house, my cars, my you know, kids' college and stuff, and this goes to man, I'd like to put some money in the stock market or something that will grow or whatever the hot tip of the day is, right? Now what we see is my paycheck. How much is going to go into my 401k? Can I even invest in my 401k? And that goes to, do I have a match? Uh, what are my investment options? Um, is going to go to pay for my home? Do I do a 30 or a 15 year? What interest rate should I get? Should I lock that in? Should I refinance? Okay, and then we have how much do I put towards college education for my kids? How much do I put towards the, the markets? Right? And you need a lot more advice because all these have different tax implications, right? This has different tax implications. These are different buckets of money. How much do I put towards protection, right? Now, there's all sorts of different insurance options available. And the same people that want to tell me to put money in my 401k don't want me to put money in insurance. And the people that want to invest in the market don't want me to put money in insurance. Okay, so now, there's a problem with the advice. How do I choose what's best for me? Well, there's a whole bunch of people out there now who serve a bunch of different purposes. So there is the insurance 
agent who is also a financial advisor, okay, that might work for a broker dealer. And all that means is they can sell insurance products, they can sell funds. Uh, if they have a Series 7, they can sell individual equities in different securities, okay? For this, they're gonna get a commission. For this, they're gonna get a commission. For this, they're probably gonna get a commission. Now, you also have the pure you know, financial advisor who probably also can sell insurance, okay? They're gonna do the same thing. They're gonna put you into funds, or equities, maybe some alternatives like real estate funds, oil and gas, something like that. And they might get a commission here, a commission here, a commission here, right? Now, these people and these people might also say, we're gonna give you financial planning. We're gonna help you figure out how much you should put in here and in here, and on top of that, how much you should spend on your home, how much you should put into your 401k, how much you should put into college savings, how much you should put into liquid money or safety account, okay? We're going to do all that for you, but of course, it's laced with the idea that I'm gonna get a commission based on what I tell you to do, okay? Now, at this time, you also have what's called the RIA, Registered Investment Advisor. Okay, a Registered Investment Advisor is actually not a person, it's a firm. Within the RIA, you have IARs, because we like to use the same letters over and over and over again. This is an independent advisor representative. Okay, I have an RIA, my partner and I, I am an IAR of my RIA. So RIAs only work for fees. They cannot get commissions for anything that they sell. And what they do is they say, we're going to take your money and we're going to invest it in a, some sort of portfolio that we'll manage for you, right? And that portfolio might involve uh, mutual funds, ETFs, alternatives, individual equities. They might go to a different money manager that they outsource to, who is much like the old mutual fund managers. Now they're money managers and they take a fee. And their fee is usually called an AUM, or assets under management. Okay. So that means that if you have $100,000 and they're taking a 1% AUM, you are paying $1,000 per year. Right? So if you invest $100,000 at 1%, you're paying $1,000 a year to this RIA. And that, and that means that if this $100,000, and this is what they'll tell you, this is what I'll tell you, if that $100,000 goes up to $110,000, right, I make more money. Well, don't you want me to be happy when your account goes up? Of course you do. So you and I are on the same side of the table. So it seems like the RIA is the best way to go. Now, RIAs will also offer financial planning. And usually they'll do it as part of their fee. They'll say, look, if you come to me, you know, minimum half a million dollars to invest, so I make $5,000 a year, I'll also give you financial planning. So I'll tell you how much you should put into your home, your 401k, your college, your liquid money. Okay. But let's be honest, the RIA, in adding financial planning on for an AUM fee, Really what they're, what they're saying is, we will give you the planning, 
but from a compensation standpoint, we really want all your money to be going into something we manage. So is the RIA really going to tell you to buy a bunch of insurance from a compensation standpoint? Probably not, because it hurts them. If you are worth several million dollars, you own a business, let's say, and someone comes to you, a friend says, look, uh, I'm starting a business, or I'm going, trying to buy this real estate, would you like to invest in it? And you come to me, and I'm the RIA with the AUM fee, and you go, hey, my friend needs $250,000 to invest in this real estate, I think it's a great deal, what do you think, Adam? And I might go, okay, it might be a great deal, However, I know that that $250,000 is probably coming out of the money I manage, and therefore that's $2,500 more that I'm not going to make next year. So as a financial planner, I might think it's a great idea, but as an RIA who has to make fees, I kind of don't want you to do it. So is my fee aligned with my duty? My duty here is what's called a fiduciary duty fiduciary obligation. These people have a suitability obligation. The difference here is fiduciary means I'm required uh, by the law to do what is in your best interest. They don't really define what is in your best interest. That's up to us to define, but I'm required to do what's in your best interest. Whatever I advise you to do has to be that. Suitability means I'm required to put you into investments or products that are suitable for you. They might not be the best, but they're, they're not scams. They're not going to take your money. Um, I'm not, I, if I were to take a 70 year old's money and put it into some sort of product that they couldn't get out for 10 years, that is not suitable. A 70 year old might need their money. Um, but if I were to take a 30 year old and put their money into something, their retirement money is something that locks it up for 10 or 20 years, that's perfectly suitable because they might not need that money until retirement. That's suitability. It doesn't mean it's the best thing for them, it just means it's suitable. These people are under a suitability standard, these are under a fiduciary standard. Now it gets even more crazy when you realize that you can be a financial advisor working for a broker-dealer and that broker-dealer can also have an IRA so I can actually do both. I can put you into a fee-based plan and I can sell you products for a commission at the same time. And you don't know who I am. And in all of that, they might even giving you the best financial advice based on your current situation. So that's the background and that will get us to um, what does the financial advisor of the future actually look like.